Hello, everyone. My name is Simone Dewing, and I work in education at the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art. You're tuning in to a virtual museum visit. Tonight, we're thrilled to have Fred Stonehouse, internationally acclaimed artist and professor of art at UW-Madison, here to talk with us about the influence of the Chicago Images, a group of figurative artists who emerged in the mid-1960s and are known for their use of vibrant color, bold lines, and for depicting the human body in a grossly distorted and highly stylized manner. Over the years, Amoka has received a generous donation of nearly 100 works by the Chicago Images from collectors Mark and Judy Bednar. Their gifted and promised works are on view now in the museum's main galleries through October 11th in the exhibition entitled Uncommon Accumulation. Thanks for joining us. And without further ado, here is Fred. Uh, hi, thank you all very much, uh, my virtual audience here today for showing up to listen to me talk about um, the influence of the Chicago images. Uh, I should give a little context for my perspective on them. When I was, um, a student, young art student uh, in the late 70s uh, in Milwaukee, Chicago was the closest real museum and gallery town that we could get to. And we would go every two weeks. We would drive down to Chicago just to see what was going on. And one of the first things I became aware of um, were the Chicago images. We would go regularly to Phyllis Kine Gallery when she was on Ontario. And I remember this, there was also a lot going on at the time. This, I should explain what was happening in art school at the time for a painter. Uh, there was a lot of emphasis on um, sort of formalist abstraction in school and um, conceptual frameworks for art in general and conceptual art more broadly uh, than that even. I mean, it was just the thing that was taken seriously. It's sort of what was in the air when I was a student. But I was going to Chicago and seeing uh, this, you know, really completely image-based work, figurative. Uh, much of it was funny. All of it was goofy, uh, you know, compared to what we were sort of taught with serious art. And I remember thinking that I never questioned myself that it was serious. The fact that it was, you know, funny and kind of strange and it had uh, often it was surreal. And that its goofiness did not detract at all from uh, the seriousness of it somehow and the impact that it had. I mean, that's how I knew this work was serious is that it was like getting hit in the face with a punch, like right in the nose when you'd see this work. So it had a dramatic impact on me. And at the same time, a lot of figurative work, um, really painterly figurative work was starting to show up from Europe and being uh, shown at the MCA in Chicago. And, uh, and a lot of American neo-expressionists were coming around and then the big Philip Gustin show happened and I became aware of the precursors to the images. I mean, it was sort of an education on the street in Chicago that I was not getting in art history class. Uh, so I found out about H.C. Uh, Westerman and uh, you know all the people who came, Seymour Rosowski and all the people who came, uh, Leon Golub, all the people who were in Chicago or had been part of forming that scene. And also the surrealist collection at the Art Institute, that was a really big part of the Imagists upbringing. So they were a generation before me, but here I am, this kid coming to Chicago and just showing up randomly at galleries and got to know the work of these artists and uh, was trying to buy some of it actually, but I was broke. Uh, so I, I really was, was responding to this work in the best possible way for me. I mean, it, that's sort of the trigger that for me that I know I really take something seriously when I want to own it. So I eventually got to know, uh, or at least meet a number of the Chicago images and really uh, my career started in Chicago. The first um, solo show I ever had was in Chicago. So um, I kind of became a part of the scene of figurative painters that were there uh, that had being that were formed looking at all this figurative work. So one of the things that really struck me uh, in a lot of their work was the fact that they were allowing themselves to see, I mean, they were all very, they were mostly students. I think maybe they were all students at the Art Institute. So they, they went to school in this renowned, you know, this fantastic art museum, right? So they, they knew art history, but they were allowing themselves to look at things, a lot of vernacular sources and there's the whole Whitney Halstead uh, story about how he was encouraging them to look outside of the academy and look at other sources for inspiration. And they absolutely embraced that. And I think that was really eye-opening for me because of my own sort of working class background and all the things that I had grown up 
not thinking about necessarily as art, but thinking about as powerful visual experiences before I even knew what art was. And then here are these people looking at the same things and getting uh, attention for it. And, and, you know, that there were a group of them uh, spanning more than a generation, honestly. So it, it was just like things clicked for me. It was like the perfect time for me to really feel like everything that I cared about, because my work is very image-based, uh, and, I, and I always had that strong image impulse in my work. It's like where all my most powerful experiences happened was in, in the making of or the seeing of images. Um, here was a, a group of artists that were just unashamedly like embracing the, the the idea of like cooking up images that were referential to the real world, but, but were so clearly uh, a construct of the imagination. And they were drawing from all over the place, of course, comics and uh, you know, folk art and outsider art and when people didn't even have a name for that necessarily yet. Um, and um, so it was a powerful place for me to be. So I've been looking at it for, for years and years and years. And, I, and a number of things have struck me about a number of the artists. So Roger Brown was one of the first people I had seen. So um, one of the things about Roger that um, besides the kind of very blunt way that he painted, I mean, it had a, a kind of, uh, you know, dumbness to it honestly uh but a, a sort of you know completely seamlessly beautiful dumbness to it and, and by dumbness i mean that in the best possible way it just was so blunt and uh you know stylized uh th just the look of them was really uh, striking but then his sense of humor in the work and the fact that he was always looking at just the world around him with a really interesting, a really interesting eye. I think he always saw the sort of absurdity and the small detail. I mean, you could, you know, there's of course the the nature of the way he used pattern. Many of them, many of the images would use pattern to great effect. I mean, Roger Brown certainly is one of them. But I think the thing that really hit me more than that, I was more attracted to uh, his sense of just the sort of absurd moment that you can observe in daily life and and i think he was always commenting on uh how we live and how we see and how strange it really is to look at at how the, how the most normal things can become very strange you know the idea that the extraordinary exists in the everyday um depending on your perspective and how you look at things i mean this is a perfect example of it this piece um, topsy turvy, which for it takes you a minute to figure out what's going on, and then even when you figure out what's going on, you're still not sure what's going on. So, uh, that sense of the sort of absurd uh interpretation of the visual world, I think, uh, really hit me. Uh, and, and also, th this idea not just with Roger, but with all of them. I'm gonna go to the next piece here. Uh, is this gonna lag on me now? Spacebar, maybe? Why is it not letting me advance? Let's see. Oh, I guess I just click on it. Maybe it's just really lagging. Um, you know, he was very famous for his um, sort of voyeur scenes where, you know, he's looking into homes and apartment buildings and uh, and there's often, you know, sort of, uh, you know, naughty scenes happening, people having sex. I think this one, there's people, yeah, there's all sorts of sexual stuff going on in some of these scenes. So, you know, at first glance, you look at a painting like this and you think, oh, it's a sort of pattern painting it's about this stylized sort of sky and these you know these very stylized buildings and silhouettes and then you realize that there really is this this idea of the um you know what's going on if you're just paying attention as sort of like a hitchcock's rear window way of looking at the work at the world and seeing uh, uh spying on other people's private lives and, and the humor and absurdity of that i think uh you know, just that that was legitimate subject matter, I think for me and, and for a lot of artists. And, and you know, I don't know if, you, if everybody's aware of this, but they're having a, a renewed influence on a lot of young figurative painters. I mean, I was young in the late 70s and early 80s, young artists, but young artists today, people half my age are uh, being influenced like uh, Julie Curtis, who is, um, and I think living in New York, but her work is really influenced by the images. And there was just a whole slew of people. I mean, I didn't write all of the names down, but I see them constantly. They're getting a lot of attention. People whose work is clearly influenced by the images. So there, I think that, you know, when I, I was just a generation removed from them and I saw them as being this crazy, almost outsider thing, right? Like 
that mostly was only getting attention in Chicago at that time. I don't know that. I mean, very few of them, if any of them were showing in New York at the time, they were showing in local galleries in Chicago, mostly false kind. And then little by little, they were starting to break into New York, but they were still not really recognized as being significant outside of the Midwest uh, in the way that a lot of us felt they were. And, and, you know, many years later, now their, their real influences kind of has trickled out into the art world. I mean, I think they're still maybe a little underappreciated, but they are gaining in uh, um, influence and um, in the art world. I think they're being looked at very seriously now by young artists. Uh, I think it's for the same reasons they influenced me. I mean, I know things go in cycles in the art world, but the fact that um, they were most of them able to have uh, real careers as artists uh, from the Midwest was also a, um, a real testament to me that you didn't have to necessarily um, bow down to whatever was happening in New York to consider yourself a serious artist, that you could just be a goof and, you know, make this kind of work in a serious way. Uh, now, Bob Lutstutter is, uh, he's, um, I mean, he's a, considered an imagist. He's a little bit outside of it. I mean, he was slightly younger than the first generation imagist, and he's slightly older than me. But um, but he's been, you know, in kind of glommed into that group uh, for a long time. Uh, when I first saw his work back in the early 80s, probably, I was just sort of blown. And he did not show a Phyllis Kine at the time, if I remember correctly. I think he might have shown at Zach's or, I don't know, somebody else. Uh, when I first saw his work, um, um, I just remember being so taken by the strangeness of these birdmen that he was painting and the, the absolutely meticulous like technique. And, and I had, and I was aware at the same time of people like Jared French and Paul Cadmus, who I feel like his work has a real affinity with it, just in terms of the, the incredibly sort of sensitive and meticulous technique, uh, not to mention some of the subject matter potentially, and certainly the surreal take on, um, on the body uh, and the, you know, again, the sort of stylization, but just the incredible craft of them while not, and not being crafted in an academic way, right? He sort of had his own incredible watercolor technique uh, that was, you know, just kind of mind blowing for a young artist who is still feeling like I was basically making a mess. And here's a guy who's got this real control of his medium. And, you know, from the get go, it felt like that to me. So I was always really taken with and, and all and often his work, he did work a little bit in larger scale, but most of his work is rather small in scale. And the fact that his work could have that kind of impact without being what everybody seemed to think was the, the only important art had to be big art, right? Like the only important painting had to be big painting. The only important sculpture was big sculpture. And the images in general were artists, uh, I mean, many of them worked large scale also, but they were a group where some of them were working incredibly small and the work, it, it was like a lesson in the idea that size is not what matters in art. It's, it's about the, the sort of resonance it can have and how a small object can have the same amount of power as a really large one. I mean, Jim Nutt's a perfect example of that, I think. And, and Bob was one of those people, like a little tiny Birdman watercolor of his could just hold you. It, it was, it would, they would like burn holes in the walls, what it felt like. It was a really powerful experience. I still feel like that about them when I see them. And I mean, I've been looking at them for 40 years and I still feel like, wow, they're pretty amazing. And the museum is lucky enough to have a bunch of them. So this is just a drawing for the same. I mean, it's pencil technique, just graphite, you know, just graphite pencils, it's so refined. I mean, I can, uh, you, the thing about Bob is that so many artists who work in a re really refined sort of meticulous fashion with, you know, with incredible rendering skills, you look at their work and you just get exhausted because you're keenly aware of how hard it was. For some reason, when I look at Bob's work, I don't feel any of the pain. He, he manages to make it look like organic or completely effortless. It just feels like they, you know, these things are like, they're real in the best possible sense. Like they don't, they're not realist, but they feel animated and, you know, they have a kind of life to them, I think, which is very convincing. I've talked in the past about uh, some of Bob's subject matter, you know, the, the um, and his, the way he deals with these sort of morphed uh, or, or sort of hybrid bodies and uh, there's a theme that runs through a number of the images work that, you know, part of it's pattern, but there's this, you know, there is a lot of this weird fetish stuff that went on, especially earlier on, 
the kind of weird binding and, and uh, you know, I'm not gonna necessarily say bondage, but there is this, this kind of sexual attention to sort of the body and the form of the body and it being bound and, um, and part of it, and then combined with that like really tight technique, it's got this, it really does have this kind of incredible tension, this really tight technique, this sort of flush that's been bound. I mean, you'll see it in, in uh, Christina Ramberg and it's of course happens in Ed Paschke. So we're gonna go into some of that. But he, he, the way he, I mean, this is earlier, this is sort of uh, before the, the two we just saw um, by some years. Um, and I, I, th I feel like some of these had some influence of Paschke in them. I mean, I've never actually asked Bob about it. I probably should have, but uh, I do think that some of these pieces from the seventies that Bob did had um, some Paschke influence. I mean, especially if you look, can you guys see my cursor moving around? Yeah. Yeah, we well, can see it. So here in this like weird diaper this guy's wearing, I mean, that's very sort of Paschke-esque, I would say. And even with these sort of bound body parts, but but then again with Bob's like completely weirdo wrinkle as if Ed's not weird enough. That's the other thing, the permission to be weird, you know, like the idea that you could be weird was like so great. It's like that weird can be serious, right? Uh, because we had been told like, uh, you know, that's so you gotta be really careful. Like you don't wanna just seem like a weirdo. Like that's just bad, it's embarrassing. I'm like, yeah, but I feel really weird. And I, I really feel drawn to these weird images. I just am like, I experienced them in, in a visceral way. And I, you know, so I was like really attracted to that. And then to see these artists doing this very seriously is like, okay, I don't really care what any, what, you know, what the, the force says. I'm just gonna go with what I see happening around me because I want in on this, you know, this sort of weirdness, I'm loving it. Here again, another, it's, you know, it's incredible piece of watercolor. This is a little bigger for him. It's kind of a big head. It's almost 20 inches square. Uh, but like, I don't, I, you know, I honestly, I've, I, uh, you know, talked to Bob over the years and I don't know what, I couldn't tell you what we ever talk about, but we never talk about the content of his work. And I feel like every time I leave him, I'm like, why didn't I ask him what that's all about? I never do. It just seems like such a natural part of him as a person. I'm like, well, it's just him. Right. But there, these, like this weird block, like, I don't even know what that block is. It's like, it's like a fake beak or, you know, I don't know. The piece is called Toucan. Uh, but the way it's tied to his face, it all seems like, you know, weirdly fetishistic sexual stuff to me. But um, I've got a sort of funny story. Well, I'll wait till we get the gym, not. Uh, well, here's uh, Gladys Nilsson. And, um, you know, I, I knew about Warrington Colescott's work at the time. And I always felt like there was some kind of connection there that the way Warrington uh, worked in etching uh, and um, and the, 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 the kind of comically stylized figures that he used and, and Gladys's, I felt like he had some sort of kinship. But the thing I really loved about Gladys's work was really her watercolors, the way she worked with watercolor. And it really influenced me uh, in a big way when I was say 20, um, the way she would work within a kind of tight contour, but then let watercolor bleed. Like you see these beautiful sort of, you know, bleeds of, of watercolor inside the figure. I, I just stole that technique and, and did it and all over the place for a long time. All my watercolors had this Gladys Nielsen. I mean, the figures were different, but the technique was very similar. I just, I still think, you know, looking at them, you could just get lost in the paint on these, um, that they're just lovely paintings. I mean, I really, I can just sit here and stare at it. I mean, they're so, and they're so complicated, you know, and then you'll, you'll be looking and you'll feel like it all has a sort of, you know, relatively sort of pastel tone. And then there's this, I don't even know, it's the sort of bottom of this like poop colored skirt down here. And it's so rich, the little weird browns in here. It's weird that the browns feel like the richest moment in these paintings to me, at least in this one. And you know, the other thing is that the work is sort of joyful, I always feel like. And it, even when I feel like there's weird stuff going on, oh, I should have talked about the title on that one. This, oh, oh it's uh, it, the goofy titles that they would often use too. I was always attracted to uh, artists and modules. Uh, artists spelled, I don't know, can you see that? It just, they were always, in, they were often engaged in word play. And I don't know, it just all had this sort of playful kind of joyful feel to me. And I, it was such a positive sort of thing to, to realize that you could, if you had those kind of inclinations that it could be incorporated in your art and that it, be, it could be taken seriously. I, I, 
maybe it's because I would, you know, you would have had to have been somebody trying to be a painter at that time to realize how uh, sort of transgressive that was uh, in a way. It was so against the grain back then that the fact that they were doing this, I mean, even more so probably in the 60s, but still in, in the late 70s, when I first discovered it, it was like, wow, these guys are crazy in like a really good way. You know, it's like being told for the first time that art, you know, like when you're a kid, you know, art's fun, right? And then at some point you realize art is agony. And then I discovered the images and I was like, oh, yeah, it's still agony, but it can be a little bit of fun at the same time. It's like you can have at least the result can be fun, right? It may be agony making it, but uh, and then there's a certain kind of agony in presenting this kind of work and expect asking people to take it seriously. So they gave permission to, I think, a whole generation of artists. And again, it's sort of happening again, uh, this permission to just be a goofball and to, you know, it's it was it's like a great gift that the images I, I think gave to the world you know, to be a real, to be eccentric in a joyful way. Now here's Jim Nutt and I, I'm just gonna, this just an anecdote I have. This is one of Jim's uh, color pencil drawings that he was making in the seventies. And I think into the eighties, I mean, probably I know he's still doing color pencil drawings, um, but these were these really refined uh, color pencil drawings of these sort of strange rooms or almost like stage sets with these, often had these big giant sort of silhouette heads in the background and then these strange figures with, you know, you know, very strange limbs and weird, uh, weird sort of surreal distortions. And, uh, you know, there's always these giant, like weird sort of uh, like floral penises and flapping vaginas in his work and, and strange breasts. And I mean, they're crazy, like anatomically, there's all sorts of weirdness going on anatomically. And uh, I think it may have been on the occasion of a show that Jim was in. I can't remember if it was an images show or Jim's show because I want to say it was, it might've been in the nineties when this happened at the Milwaukee art museum, Jim had a big show. I, I, I haven't checked my dates, so I, I could be off on what the show was, but Jim was speaking and uh, in front of a big crowd at the art museum and uh, in Milwaukee. And they, in the Q and a, somebody, uh, they asked, you know, people were asking questions and somebody asked the question, Jim, um, can you talk a little bit about the sexual content in your work? And his response was, um, my work has no sexual content. And then he went on to the next question. And I just remember thinking, oh, you can also just lie at, uh, at a talk and just refuse to answer a question. And I thought that was kind of hilarious. And if, if, you've, if you know Jim, it's not a big surprise that he would not entertain that question, but it, it was still pretty funny in the moment. Oh, but now this uh, on my screen, it looks it looks about as faint as it probably does in real life. Uh, and I'm not sure what kind of paper this is on, uh, because I'm not there. If I was, I could probably talk about that. But uh, more recently, Jim has switched to doing these. Uh, and I'm not sure what he's doing right now, because I haven't seen his work recently. But over the more than the past decade, he has been doing these very, very stylized and refined portrait busts. He's been doing them in painting and in um, these uh, graphite drawings. And, and the, of course, they're incredibly precise drawing, like very, very, very careful drawings. The gradients are really carefully built up from pencil strokes. I mean, if you see them in person, they're much more physical than this looks here. It looks very slight, but, and it is in a way, it's sort of light filled, but, um, but he often, a number of them, I'm not sure if this is one of these, but he would draw them on this very coarse watercolor paper. So he was making this incredibly refined image, but like he was, he, like he it somehow seemed like he relished the torture of having to try to make a, like the resistance that the paper would give him to making this kind of image. It's almost like he was a masochist. It's like, why would you do that? Why would you use that kind of paper, this incredibly rough watercolor paper to make this super refined image? It like made no sense to me. But again, you know, after meeting Jim a few times, it's like, oh, I, I kind of get it. It's, it's, I don't know if it's necessarily the challenge or just that kind of tension that's created when you see the physical object in person realize it's almost like a, uh, a crazy, like sort of showing off of his incredible facility. That's like, well, any, you know, dope can make a refined drawing on like a Bristol or a plate finish paper, right? But how many people can do this kind of refined drawing on this sort of elephant hide that I'm drawing? And I'm like, oh man, it's pretty amazing. Uh, but the, the, you know, again, the stylization, they're just so weird, 
for one, and so beautiful at the same time. I mean, they're like exquisitely beautiful and incredibly weird things. I mean, just the combination of those two ideas doesn't seem like it should go together, but it absolutely does in Jim's work. And in fact, I'd say in all of the best of the images, that's the truth. So here, Ed Paschke, you know, you know, pretty refined sort of oil painting technique, uh, kind of traditional oil painting technique in a way, but, um, you know, I mean, it really doesn't get much weirder than Ed Paschke from the 70s. Um, I mean, I don't even know where to go with it. Uh, one of the things, I mean, a lot of people are sort of amazed by his, his uh, the way he would paint. And I and his painting is beautiful. And if you see it in person, um, it's actually much more painterly than it appears here. I mean, you really do see every stroke. These are not done with airbrushes. They're all painted with a brush, uh, even though they kind of give off the effect of, of being airbrushed. Uh, but they're pretty physical. They're just little dabs of paint everywhere to create this sort of effect. But, you know, the, the kind of nightmarish strangeness of, you know, this orifice in place of a head or, or like maybe it's a head bent down and this, I don't know, this is the top of this strange head. It's just, they're all slightly nightmarish from this period, uh, but lushly beautiful and, you know, incredibly rich color. Um, but you know, powerful. And these are uh, this one's not super big, but some of his work from even from this period was pretty big. And then by the time I was seeing a lot of it in the '80s, it was huge. Some of it was huge, so it would really you know could take over a room. And Ed was the nicest guy on the planet. He would actually come to my shows. I was like this little pissant from Milwaukee having a show in Chicago, and Ed would show up and like comment on the work. He was famous for that. He would show up to younger artists' work uh, shows and you know drop a little you know, smart bomb on them at the opening and then go on his way. But he was just always a super supportive guy. Uh, just a lovely man, I always felt. This is one of his pieces from the 80s, yeah, 84. Um, and I mean, I don't know exactly what Ed had to say about them, but you know, there was a lot of commentary about them being about, you know, sort of video, that's sort of the influence of the video screen and television and, uh, you know, in this sort of like technology interface with uh, images. Uh, he was one of the first people to do that in a really interesting way. Uh, but again, it's just these very kind of powerfully strange images. These figures are like uh, irradiated. And, and even the earlier work, that earlier piece, which is from, I think, the earlier 70s, um, had that sort of irradiated feel. His color eyes kind of had that. They would sort of glow. So here's Christina Ramberg. Uh, you know, I remember as a younger guy not thinking that much about Christina Ramberg. First of all, I didn't see it that much. I don't think she showed necessarily as much as the others. But it, for some reason, it hit me later. I'm, I'm not sure why that is. But when it finally did hit me, it really blew me away. I, I think it just took me a while to get Christina Ramberg. Um, and I don't know, there was just something about the kind of it's not necessarily like I, I got the whole thing, the body thing that she was doing and the, and her like obsession with like pattern and, and like things and certain, seeing equivalencies between like a head and like a coconut and, you know, and the way she would sort of fetishize women's clothing and, but she, she would do it with everything. There was this kind of fetishistic quality to everything she did, but I don't think that's why it finally hit me as being, for me, being personally, being really interesting. It's something that had, it had something to do with the kind of clunky stylization that she had. It was, it was, uh, it's strange because it, it's clunky, but it manages to feel really elegant at the same time. Um, and I don't know, I can't really tell you why it works that way. It's, that's the magic of it, I guess, is that it has this kind of clunky sort of folkiness, but then it's really carefully made. And uh, they're just aff affecting, they really affect me, especially her drawings for some reason. Um, but here's one of her, again, those, and, the, and the sort of weird, you know, liberties she takes with the body again, which most of them did, um, you know, the, the truncating things and, you know, how a body could be more than just a representation of a naturalistic body. This one is really great, I think. Um, and uh, the other thing I loved about her, and H.C. Westerman did this too in a lot of his drawings, he, he would always do these self-portraits where he had this sort of shiny hair. 
and Christina would do these this shine on you know on things like in hair and in uh, like lingerie. She would do this crazy paint, carefully painted, you know, shine. And uh, and I mean, I was one of those things like, oh yeah, that's great, just as an effect. And when you really want to highlight the sort of slickness of something, to do this goofy sort of cartoon shine on stuff. I just love that. I think, do we have one of her drawings? No, we don't have any of her drawings, too bad. Her drawings are fabulous. Uh, she would do these drawings of like, just stuff. Like, you know, there's like, and then they would sort of mutate on the page. She might do a whole thing. I'm not sure, I'd have to check on this. And I don't know if Mel is listening in, she probably knows this. I feel like Christina must have been a, Re a Reyoshita student at some point because there are certain things in her drawing. Well, her painting for sure, she had to be, she's certainly connected with Ray. Um, but uh, this, uh, you know, this idea of creating sort of sets of images that sort of morph as they move through the set. So she, I can't remember exactly, but she would have like a drawing of a candy bar and there was a cut candy bar. And as it went, like by the end, it sort of becomes a ham or something, you know, it's like always just playing with variations on a motif and the idea of morphing form. She's really good at that. This is an early Carl Worsham, I think 69. Yeah, his work, um, I feel like his work and Jim's work from that period were more closely related. And, and then um, Carl sort of moved into this, uh, you know, kind of stuck with this sort of graphic quality of this early work, but he moved into like a really interesting sort of toy like uh, refinement that came later. Like this is sort of, I don't know, like a little more shockingly weird and later it becomes more, I mean, this is pretty playful too, in my opinion, but it's maybe seems stranger and the work later becomes, and the way the figure ground relationship works in his, and in his paintings changed also as he went on. And more like this, this is, I think a colored pencil drawing, right? Or pastel on paper. Uh, but this is uh, all his later paintings look this from the eighties, but his paintings became more like this is uh, I think he famously has like, he has a collection of all sorts of tchotchkes and weird things and toy robots and whatnot. But uh, um, the work became, it wasn't, it's not always super symmetrical, but, uh, but I think it's really strong often when it's very symmetrical, but this idea that these, this kind of crossover between like toy robot, Kachina spaceman, like idea, like, uh, alien, I don't know, they're, it's just, again, one of those things that's like, so incredibly uniquely his vision, um, even the way it's put together. It's one of the reasons that, I mean, I'm not, I can't speak for them, but the, I feel like they're looking at outsider and vernacular sources, uh, allowed them to come up with all sorts of inventive ways to create figures that were non uh, academic standard, you know, these were not academy approved methods of making things. I feel like though they're really refined, they were just sort of inventing their own way of seeing and making things. So, I mean, it's, you know, again, now we're seeing a lot of younger artists being influenced by their methods and their imagery. I, I'm kind of coming to the end here, I think, uh, and just in terms of the images that I selected. So here's a Ray Yoshida piece. I was talking to Simone about this earlier. For some reason, I thought, I was thinking this was painted this way on a piece of paper, but it's actually a collage of crayon drawings on paper. So, but uh, I, th I don't think it was a drawing that was torn. I think the pieces were torn and drawn and then sort of arranged like this, but I don't know, Ray's dead. So it's hard to say what he, how he did it. Maybe somebody knows, but um but again, they have this sort of pseudo, this is like, there's a lot of Christina Rambergs that are sort of like this too. They have this pseudo abstract, pseudo figurative thing going on. There's, they, they exist in this space somewhere between abstraction and figuration and they're, they, feel, they feel animated. They're, they feel like live things, even when they're just sort of pattern. Like you can't quite put your finger on anything that's, you know, too much like anything you could recognize as being alive, but they have that attitude of feeling like they're alive like they're animated or somehow full of life but his uh tendency to like, like he often was he would do a lot of his paintings are sort of arranged in these rows and his drawings and uh, there's a collage coming next that is sort of like that but it was a, a thing he would do often and a good friend of mine mike nolan who uh and i would bump into ray at flea markets also but we had talked about it and he told me that we were looking at a ray yoshida show once and and it was pieces like this that are arranged in these rows he said you know i was at a flea market once with Ray and he was holding and I, and later now I know he had collected them, but he said he was holding uh, a button card. And I don't know if you guys know what a button card is, but it's a thing that seems, you know, people who sewed would uh, keep um, 
you know, like if they had spare buttons, they would sew them to like a piece of cardboard often. And then uh, in a display, like in rows. So there'd be like a bunch of red buttons or maybe there'd be sort of a prismatic uh, fade of different colors and sizes with buttons. But there were these kind of graphically beautiful arrangements of buttons on, on, um, on a card and, and Ray was buying them. And Mike was like, what are you buying this cards full of buttons for? And he's like, look at this thing. It's like an incredibly beautiful sort of unintentional art object. Uh, and, uh, and really, you know, that was one of those moments when I heard that, that I was like, oh, that makes so much sense about, you know, that, that idea of things being arranged that, and even the way it sort of references the idea of the modernist grid, but a, like a much funkier version of it. So here's Ray's like manipulations of the comics. Um, he, and he did many, many, many of these. Uh, they're just sort of, you know, wonderfully whimsical collage things using like all, you know, the same kind of material. I think these are mostly made out of sort of, I don't know, I mean, they could, might be from comic books, but I feel like they were often from just the Sunday papers potentially. But he really seamless, I mean, like he was an incredible craftsman and again, very meticulous technique. It's one of the signatures of the um, images in general that they mostly had pretty, you know, very meticulous technique. I mean, the kind of finish fetish thing that happened with the images was, you know, pretty universal. Like the group mostly had it. They, they weren't big on like wild expressionism uh, or like super expressionistic paint. It was like all really beautifully crafted and carefully controlled. And this collage is no different. You know, interestingly, there was an artist in Sweden, at, I think in Sweden at the same time, Oivind Falström, who was doing very similar collage work. And I don't know if they ever met or even knew each other, but it's just sort of a weird coincidence that they were both using the funnies at the same time to, or comics to create these interesting collages and even sort of arranged in similar ways. But, um, but yeah, that's what I have to say. So uh, I am happy if to entertain any questions. Should I stop sharing here? Hey, Fred, uh, feel free to leave, uh, leave it up or take it down, whatever. Um, okay. we'll, we're, uh, I can field some of these questions here. So uh, here's a question from Guzo, who's a um, oh, recent sure. graduate. Yeah, you know, uh, of UW-Madison's art department. Uh, Guzo says, Fred, if the images are regional art style slash movement, is there a second wave of this movement going on now and who would be in it? Are you sort of a contemporary descendant of the images? Well, I don't know that I'm a descendant specifically of the image images. I've sort of been glommed on with them, but I mean, I'm maybe a little bit of a mashup between, uh, you know, my, you know, I was hugely influenced by surrealism, obviously, uh, but the combination of my interest in uh, sort of classic surrealists of the 20s and 30s, then the imagists, and um, some of the precursors to the images, people like Gertrude Abercrombie, and then the mad, you know, magic realists like John Wilde. Those are the the influences. Um, that I had, but my work has always had that uh, sort of very specific kind of dreamy weirdness, but yeah, they were, they were, I mean, for sure they were a huge influence on me. I don't know that I could be seen as a second generation imagist. I think there are people who are considered second generation images within the imagist movement. I mean, some of the people we looked at are probably more like second generation images, but, um, but uh for sure, there's a generation of artists. Now, I think I mentioned Julie Curtis, but there's a bunch of them. I mean, I would even argue that somebody like, oh, I can't think of her name. Oh, Francesca something. I can't think of her last name. Anyway, there's a bunch of young artists right now working that are uh, clearly influenced by the images. They're just making work. I mean, in some cases, there are people my age who are like, those bastards are ripping off the images. It's like, no, it's just, it's like this wonderful new sort of, iteration of that vocabulary again i think the fact that that comes back around is a real testament to the staying power of the images so uh i mean there's a bunch of them. i should have probably made a list i could have rattled them off at some point but i've got you know the usual like i don't remember names anymore unless i write them down but they're out there i mean i'm sure guzo you've been seeing them for sure and they know who they are <laughs> So I hope that answers your question. But I mean, I would be happy to be considered a second generation imagist, but uh, I mean, I probably get more easily glommed in with surrealists and magic realism than, than imagism, though I'm clearly an imagistic artist. You know, I mean, images, everything in my work, that's what, that's what generates it. That's what it's about, the power of that. Yeah, thanks Fred. Sure. Um, and thanks Guzo for, for your question. 
Um, so far, we don't have any other questions at the moment, but um, that's okay with me. I guess, yeah, I'd be curious to hear. Um, I'll ask you one of my own here. Um, it, just thinking about like uh, influences and, and what inspired the images to to make some of these um, these works, and thinking about like consumer culture and pop culture and kind of the you know the post war boom and and just like, kind of like life, social life in, in the sixties. Um, you know, a lot of it could be looked at as critique, but, you know, you hear time and again that, you know, the images were not really interested in, in a political commentary or critique and, um, and they had sort of a way of, of um, you know, dancing around that or sort of projecting any um, explicit, um, you know, uh, political um, quality to their work. Uh, do you have yeah, thoughts about that? Yeah, I do. It's sort of interesting, especially because they were, you know, uh, children of the 60s and they were growing up during civil rights unrest and all the craziness um, and it was happening in Chicago just like it was happening across the country at the time uh, but um, I don't I don't know I mean I think that they may have just felt I'm, I can't really speak for them and I'm sure there are historians art historians who have talked about that I, I do think there were some of the early pieces that uh, not that we're looking at here today but I, I feel like there were probably early works of the images, pieces from the 60s that did make comments on the Vietnam War that were vaguely political, but that just wasn't their thing. They weren't uh, hugely conceptual in that way. They didn't have a political gripe uh, that they expressed in their work. I think that for me, their work just felt like it was so much about visual discovery. And, and maybe, I mean, you could talk like the Dada, if you were to talk about Dada as a, a thing that was meant, was, was reaction you know, reactive to the war, right? Um, at the time that it was, and there, and a lot of it was explicitly political, but much of it was just absurd. And the, the notion that in the face of like incredible sort of cultural trauma, that absurdity is um, a legitimate vehicle for artists and, and a legitimate way to express um, or like a manifestation of the fact that the system doesn't work so why bother following its rules? I mean, it, it could be that their rebellion was uh, was political in that sense because they were breaking all the rules of the way the art world worked. They weren't, you know, abstract expressionism had been the big painterly thing. Then there was color field painting and conceptualism was really holding sway. And a lot of that was very political. And they were their I think their rebellion, if it, you could say that, or their political statement was like, no, screw all of it. We're just going to go nuts here a little bit. And indulge just completely absurd aesthetic and that in its own and in, in its own way I think still resonates as being the fact that it had this incredibly sort of you know disrespectful kind of, and, and it wasn't actually disrespectful towards art it sort of loved art and it and it, it a lot of it was homage to great art right but the idea of of um of you know the sort of just the academic attitude they didn't care about it they were like they did not want that and i think the the fact that uh conceptualism at the time was getting a lot of attention much of it being very political and uh, being you know cerebral and and being sort of embraced by the system and by the way the new york art world worked i think that their their rebellion against that i i think still resonates today like and it works today that kind of it's the way data still works today you can look at you know, uh, pieces from the teens and it's, they're still powerful. Not because you even know specifically what the political motive of was it, but just because they're powerful, absurdist things. And that, especially when you're living in a absurdly uh, violent and traumatic times, it, you know, I don't know, it, maybe it represents some sort of weird release, I guess. I'm not sure, I'm not an art historian. I just react to things. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't necessarily have an answer for it. I mean, my understanding of the influence of the images is purely from how they influenced other artists. And much of that is because of their sort of the, the you know, the visual qualities of the work and a sense of sort of absurdist shock that so much of it still has today. I mean, I have students that are still, you know, discover Jim Nutt and uh, Carl Worsman at Paschke today, lar you know, largely because the museum has so many great pieces by those people. And they're really like blown away by it in the same way I was 40 years ago. So it's it, the fact that a work of art can still have that power. I mean, I think that's a real testament. And and it and it age, you know, it's held up really well over time. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Thank way, you. Yeah. Sure. Thanks I could you that. know I could blab on and on for hours <laughs> about that. I suppose, but 
Yeah. Well, maybe I'll ask one last question. Uh, we haven't received any others through the chat, but uh, um, just in terms of uh, kind of formal, like, um, or experimentation with different media, um, you know, I'm thinking about like the pinball machines, like the reverse painting that a lot of the images use, in particular right. Jim Nutt and Jim Barbara Nutt, Rossi yeah. and, um, and kind of this uh, play with materials um, and, and this kind of like neon and capturing the kind of, um, you know, vibrancy of, of um, you know, nightlife or I don't know, just like everyday life. I think uh, that's something that kind of draws me to, um, to the images is, is it's not just painting, it's not just drawing, right? It's, it's really um, kind of runs the gamut. Yeah, and it's I mean it had a, such an attitude and a vibe about it that again was you know kind of surprising that and, and you know some people say oh it's garish you know but like you know the you know street life in Chicago I'm sure was you know they were like blocks from State Street uh, as students and living in the city all of them at one point and uh, experiencing you know like this enormous city and the way things looked I mean there of course is a connection to pop art which they were all aware of because they they were all that was also a huge thing to uh, you know going on uh, while they were young uh, that they were seeing Lichtenstein and Warhol and uh, and all in all the pop artists so there is a pop uh, sort of undercurrent in the way they made work too and and the the embracing of sort of commercial methods that the pop artists use i think that reverse painting on glass thing that you would have seen on like a, a you know a store window or a pinball machine and and of course then the incredibly slick surface that you had you know you you would have like you no matter how much paint you put on the back of that thing it's still got this absolutely per pristine glass front so uh but again like jim not especially like those incredibly beautiful reverse paintings on glass or on plexiglass i guess they were um well that makes I me think of uh what you were saying before with, you know, Jim Nutt also working with this incredibly textured textured, paper. Right, right. So kind like of, the you know, again, that the, spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the love of difficulty and uh, like, obviously he really loves that challenge of like a really incredibly, I'm, I'm surprised he didn't end up doing something like egg temper. I guess that was just too foofy for him. He really wanted that something that had uh, this other kind of, you know, brutal resistance to him. I don't know. I, I mean, I, again, I've never, you know, I, whenever I would see Jim, I would just sort of do the like, you know, I am not worthy and bow down. I was always too embarrassed to ask him any specific questions because he was like the master. So I didn't, uh, I never had the guts to ask him like specific technical questions. I mean, I probably would now, but I never did back then. So cool. Um, we do have uh, two more questions, actually. Um, All right. If you can spare a few more minutes here on the stream. Sure. Uh, <laughs> Um, all right, here's from, let's see, from Anne uh, asks, with the collection at Amoka, Madison now has a pretty great representation of Images Works. This is true. Yes. Uh, do you have any idea why these collectors have been drawn yeah. to Madison? Uh, might, I don't know if, I don't you, know, know if, if the, you know how to answer that. <laughs> uh, well, I don't because I don't know if they were drawn to Madison or the Madison people were drawn to the Images. I'm not sure. This is one of those chicken and the egg things. I'm not positive. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I'm sure that the people who collect this stuff, I, you know, I was actually Larry Aronson who owns a bunch of great early uh, images stuff. He was at, uh, I, I saw him in an opening at the Chazen not too long ago. And he actually talked to me a little bit about how he, and a lot of his stuff is like worth tons of money now because they're really key early pieces by the images. He, he and he was always drawn, to, he was always drawn as a young collector to, early, to imagistic work. So he was trying to buy uh, an H.C. Westerman piece. And H.C. Westerman was this precursor to the images, the uh, same kind of funky, great, you know, really incredibly crafted stuff. I mean, I don't want to go off into too big of a tantrum, but Westerman is one of my heroes. But but he was trying to buy, I think, one of Westerman's death ships, this really kind of signature piece. And it was available at Frumpkin Gallery in New York. And Larry was there, and he wanted to buy it. And um, uh, Alan Frumpkin said, no, nah, you, you know, you, I can't sell it to you. You're just not a serious enough collector. I mean, I'm saving this for a serious collection. And Larry was so pissed about that, that he thought, screw this. I'm here. I have the money. I can buy it. And I, and I get it. I know what's going on with these artists and I, and I love them and they won't let me buy it. Like, I'm not good enough for that, for this sort of New York snob scene. So if he thought, forget it. And he was from Chicago. So he said, I'm just going to start going and knocking on artist doors in and get to know the artists in Chicago. And that's what drove him, according to the story he told me just a year or so ago, what drove him to starting to collect the images back in the 60s that he was like, I can, you know, I'll 
I don't care if they don't care about me. I don't care about them. I'm going to just find my own way to get the work I want. And he just, and so he was buying directly from artists, I think early on and managed to build this, you know, fabulous collection by just ignoring what was going on in New York and, and not being unaware of it, of course, but sort of ignoring that them sort of looking down their nose at this like young, you know, young guy who wanted to start collecting instead of nurturing this young guy, they, you know, took a dump on him and he's like, well, I'm just going to do it at home. And I, I mean, I think that's one of the things that I loved so much about the whole Imagist uh, phenomenon is that it was homegrown and it stayed home for so long and it really left a permanent mark on the Midwest. And I think that uh, uh, in terms of the vernacular of, of uh, like what goes on in artists' minds, it's like what we were seeing and what we can continue to see. And, and now the fact that it's like gotten kind of huge, yeah, I think it, it shows that it was really pretty great all along. And I think people are, you know, especially now that the world is getting smaller, New York is having a very hard time being the center of anything. I mean, it was the center of coronavirus for a while, which is probably not the best thing, but um, but it's having a hard time. I mean, people still go there. The art world still is mainly like kind of housed there, but it's also become incredibly diffused. And this notion that you can, you know, sort of think globally and act locally, that's been in the air for a long time. And it certainly was in the air. I mean, the notion of Chicago as the second city, like they always had kind of a chip on their shoulder about that. And it wasn't just the artists, the collectors had it and people sort of had it. And a lot of people resisted that later. Like by the time the 80s came around, there were a lot of people in Chicago who were saying, oh, I, we don't want that label anymore. We really are cosmopolitan in the same way New York is, right? And, and but I think I like that sort of like stubborn sort of provincialism in a way, the idea that we are regional and proud of it, you know, like, and I've talked about this in the past, the notion that there are so many things that are loved all over the world because of their spe specificity, because they're specifically from a place, right? Like, you know, I, I'm from Milwaukee and Harley Davidson, like, people would like burn the factory down if they ever moved completely out of Milwaukee. You know, they would, nobody would buy Harleys anymore. It's like, it's so like, they're so proud that it's made in this funky Midwestern town. And, and like, why can't art be like that? Right. Like why does art have to be branded by like some authority that exists half a country away. Right. So uh, clearly the image just didn't care about that, or maybe they did and they just can do anything about it. So, and it took a long time for them to really get their due, but they're getting it now. And, you know, many of them are still around plugging away. So, uh, I mean, I, so, and as being somebody who was from the Midwest and stayed, except for very briefly stayed here, uh, you know, I, I can't not love that about it. I, I don't have any idea what the original question was, but I think I, uh, <laughs> I'm hoping I answered it. I sort of went off on my soapbox, I think. No, that's good. I think that's, uh, people want to hear these, these kinds of stories. I think it, it makes all the, you know, the work richer, I think. Um, uh, so a few more here. I think I'll skip to uh, Shane, uh, who asked, can you discuss the images influence on the Milwaukee art scene of the 80s to today? Uh, assuming being from Milwaukee, you might have have something to say about that. Yeah, I think, you know, honestly, I mean, I think they were a big influence on me and certainly we were sharing our interest in a bunch of us that would go to Chicago and see it. Uh, but we, I think there was a lot of influence, especially with figurative painters in Milwaukee at the time. The, the neo-expressionist thing was just like a juggernaut. It was hard to not see that at the time in the eighties as being the thing, right? It was like, you know, all the Germans, you know, Baselitz and Immendorf and and then, you know, Schnabel and, and like everybody's just pooping their pants over that. It was like this, for one, it was like the first big international movement to happen in my lifetime. It was like, you know, before that there was sort of American movements. And then here was this like wave of people from Europe coming in. It was sort of syncing up with some of the weirdness that was happening here. And, you know, for me, it was just this incredibly weird soup uh, of figurative imagery. I just feel like like, first of all, I felt inclined towards that kind of work anyway. And for me, the images fit right into that. The surrealist, the images, the magic realist, the neo-expressionist, and then the big Philip Gustin show happened. And then there was a, this giant show at the MC in Chicago called Expressions. Like everybody went out and bought the catalogs. So we could, you know, that's the first time we saw Kiefer. And, and it was sort of like the lid had been blown off of this sort of you know, what we had felt like was this kind of, in some ways, a kind of repressive history that painting had been forced into, that you could only paint certain ways and that there were rules about what was allowed and that figuration generally was considered so retrograde that it, like you should be embarrassed if you're even doing that. 
and and then when this like this giant international thing happened we were like oh we all wanted to do it anyway and we're sort of secretly you know like as soon as we got out of school everybody was like making weird cartoons and strange figurative paintings and then suddenly this huge thing happens we're like oh i guess it is okay so we were all i don't know it was just in the air it was certainly in the air in milwaukee uh but there was a lot of crazy stuff going on in milwaukee at the time and milwaukee had this really fun scene because the stakes were so low you know studios were super cheap we we're all living on like rice and beans you could get like a plate of rice and beans and tortillas in milwaukee for a buck and like be good to go for like eight hours in the studio and then beer was like 250 for a 12 pack you know it was crappy beer but like we were uh and all the artists hung out and you know everybody drank together it was like a real scene in the early 80s um so you know, I don't know exactly how much influence. Yeah. I mean, Milwaukee, I think always, again, like Chicago in relationship to New York, Milwaukee, I said, yeah, I mean, she, I, if this is a Shane, I think it is. He knows he should know well the attitude that Wisconsinites have towards Illinois generally. Like I didn't like, cause I love Chicago, but, uh, but I think Milwaukee generally had like, we don't need Chicago. We don't need New York. We don't need anything. We can live here and uh, just do our own thing. You know, like to the point where we were like, you know, nobody's paying attention. So we'll start our own art newspaper and we'll, uh, we'll just, we'll start our own galleries. And because you could, because it was cheap and, uh, and, you know, and, it, and the, the, the entire range of uh, sort of our art experience was going on. I mean, theater people were hanging out with painters and there were uh, conceptual artists and writers and performance artists all kind of hanging together. And it was this incredibly fertile scene and that Chicago images thing and the, our proximity to Chicago Certainly, I mean, maybe secretly everybody's sort of running down there. I think the theater people were probably going down because of the great avant-garde theater that was happening in Chicago at the time. But the MCA and the Art Institute, you can't, you couldn't be an artist in Milwaukee and not go there and participate in that. Uh, we just sort of had our own funky melange of weirdness in Milwaukee that was sort of all over the place. We just didn't discriminate. Like imagism was as good as abstraction, which was as good as performance art, which was as good as writing. I mean, we it was just a really rich creative environment where everybody was talking to everybody. You know, photography, filmmaking, uh, it was really pretty great. Of course, it was super cheap and an easy place to be. And again, you know, you get in some crap, even the crappy cars can make it to Chicago. So like, <laughs> it was, so I, I hope that, I mean, I know it doesn't really say much about how the images uh, influenced Milwaukee in the 80s, but uh, the influence was there along with a whole bunch of other streams of influence. It was just an incredible time in the art world, I think. Plus, people would buy stuff. I mean, they would buy your old underwear. It didn't matter. I mean, like people wanted to buy art. So you could sell art. And I were like, suddenly like, like, you know, my first, I was 23 when I had my first solo show in Chicago and I sold everything. Now it was super cheap, but, you know, like people were buying art. They were really engaged in, in wanting you know, like there was excitement around it of course like the money was like falling off of trees in the 80s so people had money to burn and and art was considered a cool thing to buy so people were buying everybody's art it's like they didn't it wasn't even about quality it was like like kind of like oh you know like i know you and you're cool and this is a cool scene and i like hanging out so i'm gonna buy your art and support you it was a super supportive environment back then and milwaukee had its own weird little version of it and i think still does really uh to be honest, I mean, there's maybe not as much money as there was in the 80s, but there's still that, you know, Milwaukeeans are like, well, you know, I guess I have to get a job, but I'm going to find a little, you know, I'm going to find a little damp hole to make my art in, you know, I'll just, uh, one, as one of my friends in Milwaukee said, all an artist needs is, <laughs> if they have space, all they require in addition to that is a dog dish with some fresh water every day and they're good to go. So I think Milwaukee still has that ethic of like, uh, you know, this is a great place to work and I'm just going to get down and dirty and do my work and then I'm going to go out and look at the world, right? So so I think they looked Thanks. at images in the same way. It was like, this. here's this great thing there. And, and again, that model of them just making their own art world, you know, like they started that way, that whole like Chicago mm -hmm. needs more famous artists, right? Like Milwaukee feels the same way, I think. And I think, you know, probably Cleveland and, and you know, Fargo and like every place in the world that has artists, everybody has that same feeling. Chicago just did it really well. <laughs> uh, well said, well said. Um, all right, I'm gonna, I think we should take two more questions and these could be the last. Um, so I think kind of wrapping up this conversation on, on uh, cross, uh, country kind of uh, collaboration or, or influence, that kind of pollination. Uh, Kurt asks, is there a correlation between 
the quote unquote ready-made aesthetic of someone like Ray Johnson, I think was based in New York, I'm not sure, um, and images Suela and Roca. Are you aware of any traveling shows between coasts? Back then? Uh, unspecified, about, I'm uh, not sure. <laughs> uh, I mean, like I was a baby when they were first happening, but uh, by right. the time there were traveling shows, I mean, I know there was a lot of communication between the West Coast and Chicago, the whole West Coast sort of Bay Area funk thing in Chicago. There were definitely shows that were put together that traveled of making that connection. Um, but I certainly think somebody like Ray Johnson, uh, in fact, it, what's the show that's up? I think there's a show up right now with Ray Johnson and who in Chicago at Carl Hammer, uh, there's a show of Ray Johnson and H.C. Westerman. Uh, so that's a show that I think probably should be in a museum and traveling, but it happens to be in a gallery, um, which is sort of great in its own right, that it's this really wonderful, crazy show happening in this little gallery. But um, yeah, I don't know. There's those cross currents between uh, in, you know, artists who maybe can be seen as sort of eccentric outliers, you know, it's like they're called eccentric outliers, right? Or they're referred to as being eccentric outliers because the, uh, the art world still likes to think that there's a mainstream in the art world. It's just, I feel like that went out the window some time ago. I remember even in the eighties, late eighties, which is like the, you know, in the thick of like the postmodern thing, right? Which is like just sort of an ironic rehash of all the modernist movements, basically. Um, I remember having a conversation I was having a show in New York and I was talking to some artist friends after the opening and I remember one of them saying like after way too many drinks saying you know what I think I know what the next thing is it's no thing <laughs> and I was like and we all laughed like oh that's ridiculous because of course there would be an, and then it kind of was true there has been since then since like the late 80s early 90s there really has been like no thing I mean there's not a thing after that it's just sort of whatever it's it, it became not like what's the thing that i can jump onto it's like are you interesting or not and if you're not I that don't sounds really kind of liberating yeah right? it's super liberating i think i really think it's like the best so this idea of like these sort of eccentric outliers i don't see them as outliers some people take a little longer to sort of rise up from the muddy bottom of the art world right to get you know rise to the surface but uh, uh i think it's a really heartening message that these outliers are their affinities between people who maybe didn't even know each other are being seen and people are in like from a position of curators like curators are starting to think oh look at these strange correlations these things that were like i mentioned that thing between ray Yoshida and even falstrom i don't know if that's ever been shown net side by side before but somebody should do that maybe they have i mean it seems like such an obvious connection but i mean i feel like those kind of connections were always sort of in the air and that it's that's still happening now. There are people like on other sides of the planet, especially now that the world is so small because of social media. It's like we don't live in regions anymore, right? I mean, this is this is right here. This little box is like uh, yeah. It's it's hard to imagine, you know, art life before the internet, right? I mean, for, yeah, for those was, of us who are making yeah, now and yeah, yeah, it was pretty great, <laughs> but you know. Artists are never ones to resist change. You know, they're like, uh, you know, like some people are, oh, I remember, like, I remember it too. And it was great. I, I'm not going to lie. It was fabulous. But this is fabulous too. I mean, like artists are like, all right, I guess this is what I have to do now. I mean, that's one of the great things about, I, I really think this is true. Real artists, not, not that, you know, this thing is real artists and not real artists, but I think I'm going to say there is, right? I'm going to say that there are real artists. And then there are people who like the idea of being an artist, but aren't real artists, right? Real artists are like, well, I guess this is what I have to do. And they just do whatever they need to do to find a way to make their art and live their life as an artist, whatever the hell that means. It doesn't mean anything in particular. It just means you manage some way. So if the world changes, you find a way to work. You know, if you're suddenly left in a tiny space, maybe you have to make tiny art. If you're suddenly without a computer, maybe you have to take it to the street. If you find you can't get into a gallery, maybe you have to open your own, or maybe you have an online platform or whatever. I mean, artists will find a way. I mean, they're, you know, creative thinking finds a way. I mean, that's the nature of it, right? It's creative. It creates answers to unforeseen problems. That's what artists always do. That's what they do. Even if they're drawing like realist drawings of eggs, they're going to find a way to like solve some new interesting problem that somebody hasn't thought about before, right? That's why the world needs artists because they're special creatures and they think differently and they have creative answers to questions that people didn't even know existed. So that's why we're here. I mean, 
At least that's my opinion. Again, I drifted so far off the question. I don't even oh, know you're fine. Now I'm like, that. I can't, I can't uh, unsee this like realistic drawing of an egg. Um, <laughs> and it's I want wonderful. it. I, I want to yeah, own it's, it. It's, you know? Right. It's, a, it's like the <laughs> best possible egg you could have. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's close out this, this uh, Q&A with a question from Anne. Um, which I think kind of nicely kind of segues into if, if any of you are watching and you're artists yourselves. Um, Anne asks, uh, many of these artists, as Fred's work too, have a very personal visual style. Can you talk about how you balance a personal visual language with an ability to draw people in or provide access to viewers who aren't familiar with the work? Yeah, it's tricky. I will say that, especially if, uh, you know, they're like one of the, you know, this is a weird thing. Like I've talked about this a lot, the idea that in Europe, this doesn't seem to be an issue. Like the idea of like finding a way to access work, like I, I'll never, I'm just going to tell a little quick story. I was doing a show in Hamburg at a gallery and, and the day after the opening, we I was back at the gallery with some friends and we, the, the owner had this deal. The owner of the gallery had this really huge basement and he would store beer for a bunch of the neighborhood taverns uh it was in the port district in hamburg and uh and so we always had access to, like tons of beer so we were on all this great like local beers there so we and it was always cold because the basement was really deep so we were we were sitting out in front of the gallery there's some like uh, wooden crates uh, drinking beer and these two kids roll up on skateboards like 10 and 12 and they're like the guy's name was ralph ralph kruger they'd like Ralph, oh, cool, you've got a new show up. And uh, because they knew we were Americans, so they're speaking English, right? And they come in, pick up their skateboards and go and check out the show. There's a 10 and 12 year old. Like the, they're, they didn't, and it was a really weird show, but they were like just digging it. They didn't care. And, and they're, because they're so used to the culture of art being wrapped up in their daily life that they just don't ask those questions. Like, right, it's so deeply ingrained in European culture that people don't, need an explanation, right? They don't, they also don't necessarily require an artist to have a sort of branded style or a signature kind of, uh, you know, you know, conceptual base, right? They, they are actually always looking for their artists to come up with something new and interesting. And like, they love that. And so, uh, so on, on the one hand, I'm like, I, I try not to care about people accessing the work, though I'm always willing if somebody, if I could give advice to like five-year-old children who are being, well, I don't because five-year-old children don't need this advice. So let's say if I could give advice to 15-year-old children about how to look at art, I would say, uh, just don't be afraid to ask questions because most artists are more than willing to like talk to you. If you don't know, like you can't find a way in to that work, just say, hey, you know, dude, can you give me a freaking clue? Help me out here. And they're mostly be like, oh, and then they'll talk you off largely. So um, the idea of making work accessible, like that notion that work should be accessible and approachable without any help from anybody. Um, and some work is, right? Some work is just sort of like so obviously open to whatever that you don't need anything, right? But a lot of work requires a little extra help. Some of it requires a lot of extra help, right? Some of the best art requires a lot of extra help, right? And it's a really rewarding experience if you're willing to do that kind of work. If you're the sort of person who doesn't want to do that, well, there's art that's really accessible. And then there's stuff that's in between, sort of like me, where it, like at first appearance, it's like, oh, I know what this is. And then you're like, oh, no, I don't. You know, it's like, that's kind of where the images are. You think you know what you're seeing, and then you suddenly realize, oh, maybe I don't really have any idea what's going on. And then that can be very off-putting. So, so to have, a, you know, like, I don't know about how to create a situation that's accessible. I mean, my strategy, and it wasn't a strategy, it just sort of happened organically, because I love things, right? I love a thing to be a kind of beautiful, well-made thing, right? A relatively well-made, like well-made enough that I can sort of trick people into like getting close, right? It's like, they're like, ooh, look at that thing. And then they get up close and they're like, oh, I have no idea what's going on. But at this point, they're invested enough to care to look at. They're there, it's too late. It's like they got up close and then they got poked in the eye and they maybe they regret it and never want to approach again. But you know, in my experience, once people get close enough, to a thing, they're curious. It's like, so I guess I would say if your work can, you know, sort of pique somebody's curiosity, if, if you can make artwork that whatever it is or however it manifests as, a, as an artwork uh, that gets people to say, huh, what's that? You know, like that's 
90 percent of the battle i feel like the rest of it is like they either will or won't get invested there's not too much you can do about it again i feel like how far off this question have i strayed here i feel like no, i, I think it. i think you're doing a great job also of weaving in you know previous uh responses and in, in that you know this idea of uh you know is the work interesting is it original is it, right does it make right. you think and you right. know, not is it tied to some kind of current or trend that right i mean know, not that that's hot, right? i mean there you know the current stuff and hot ideas i love all that you know it's like that's great too i just don't feel like there are any rules when it comes to that i feel like as soon as you start you know one of my great i mean philip gustin said this years ago he said Actually, Willem de Kooning said this to Gustin when Gustin was vilified by the whole abstract expressionist sort of art world, right? Critics and artist friends who wouldn't talk to him anymore when he started painting those dumb figures in the late 60s. Uh, uh, de Kooning came up to him in, at the opening and he said, I get it. I get it. I get what this is, what's going on here. Like abandon his like kind of, you know, really rarefied abstraction and started making these big clunky figures. De Kooning said, it's about freedom. And that's really still the biggest thing for artists. If you feel trapped by some notion of what your art is supposed to be, you've given up your freedom. And so, um, yeah, I, I mean, even the responsibility to your own style, if you know, if you have a style, and I certainly have a style, I'm constantly trying to battle against whatever that means, right? I mean, I'm not doing a very good job of it, but I, I try, right? It's like one of those things where uh, as soon as you feel trapped by something, you have to do something to sort of not be trapped, to sort of re-free yourself from your own habits. And I think people who look at art, I would say, and people may not like this, but I would say they have the same responsibility. Like if you have habits of what you look at, things that you know you like, it's like try some fucking green tea ice cream. Excuse my language. Sorry. It's like try something different. You know, try something you've never had you know, like, go look at it, make an effort to try something else. We do it in all other sorts of places in our life. You know, you might go buy some crazy socks you never wore before, like do the same thing with art. If there's something you don't think you get and you think, well, that's not my thing. Well, you may not have given enough of a shot to know if it's your thing. So I don't want to really turn this back on the audience, but I feel like the only way art works is if really as a form of communication is if the artist is putting something out there, the artist is always putting out something that they're trying to engage an audience always. I mean, almost always. I mean, there are probably rare cases where they give no shits, but, uh, but most artists are trying desperately to have their voice heard. And I think, and I know there's an audience out there that really wants to hear what artists have to say. And, and if they're finding roadblocks or frustrations, they, those don't last long. It doesn't take a lot to figure, you know, to, to, uh, uh, find a space where you can start to understand what artists are saying even the most esoteric and sort of uh, uh theoretical theoretically sort of um, elevated art is still meant to communicate to somebody right it's it has something to say so and of course the work like the images it's like i mean it again it sort of punches you in the nose i mean a lot of now it punches you in the nose. And that's one of those things where people are like, well, I don't want to be punched in the nose. So that's the way that certain works like make people walk away. Right. Uh, well, and I think, so I, I think people are, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I would have just kept going until like midnight. So it's probably <laughs> good. You cut me off. Well, no, I was gonna um, just add that. I think, you know, uh, all, all people, you know, humans are inherently, you know, conservative out of our need to, to survive. And so we, right we look at things that are unfamiliar in it, there's a discomfort and a, just like an uncomfortability with that. And so I think, um, I love that you flipped that of like, you know, as an artist, you know, try to push yourself and not, you know, not get stuck, right? But um, yeah. as a viewer too, right? Like uh, why not feel a little like unsure about something, right? And why not yeah. approach those with with the same amount of enthusiasm that you might something that you you feel like you get upon seeing it. Yeah, I'm gonna say something super elitist right now that's gonna riff off this. I tell my art students all the time that uh, artists are special because I really believe that we are special. We see the world differently. And and that and it's a needed view of the world, I think. The way we interpret reality is, is important because of the fact that it's not conservative necessarily and that it does break some rules and it does challenge our thinking, right? And I think that the art audience, now this is where, you know, of course, like I'm being an elitist about artists, right? But I think art audiences should also, also not should, but do like real art audiences challenge 
thinking, right? When you commit to like learning about a certain kind of art, you are not being conservative. You are taking a chance. You are going to this crazy land that artists live in, and you are joining in the experience. You are communicate. You are finishing the communication. You're connecting those two poles, right? You're you're the one who's like putting that cable on the battery and making the charge happen. So it's just as important what the the audience brings to that conversation. And I think often art audiences are so insecure about it because they feel like artists are talking in this like really esoteric language and, and they are, but I think the art audience has to understand that they are already very eccentric in their own right because they're interested in art. Just the impulse to want to look at art is in this country anyway, it's not the natural thing it is in Europe. It's like, you're already a special person because you want to be engaged in art. Even if you're not a maker of art, somebody who wants to consume it as, as an audience, that you're already a weirdo. Just go with it and don't be afraid to like fly your freak flag. Just go and ask crazy questions because like it, they're all pretty much welcome. So, so I guess that's what I would say, like you, like we need you, you probably don't need us, but artists need that audience connection. Right. And if you are somebody who's interested, don't be afraid to go out there and just make that connection happen because you're the one who makes the connection complete. You complete the circuit. Totally. Thank you, Fred. I think that's a great place to end. I think that's it. Don't, don't be afraid to let your freak flag fly. I think that was uh, <laughs> some sage advice uh, from, from Fred uh, concerning the images and, and making uh, in today's kind of, you know, tumultuous and, and absurd world. Uh, right. So thank you everyone for joining. Thanks Fred for your time. Thanks everyone. Thank yep. you, Simone. Uh, thanks to the museum and thanks for putting up this great show. Bye everybody. Cool. Bye y'all.